Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ian. Um, I must admit, in Louisville, Kentucky, if you did that to a horse, that's basically blasphemy. Uh, as you know, we are the home of the Kentucky Derby and have a, a rich uh, horse history. Going forward, I wanted to go ahead and sort of take a lot of what we already talked about and really get this into how we use it in, in clinical practice, particularly in my own um, practice in Louisville. And um, so going forward, as you know, in, in Louisville, we are certainly known for our basketball and in the midst of March badness, I think um, it's a sort of an important place and, uh, and I'm sure many of you were riveted with the game last night. However, the other thing that we're really known about is this issue of burden of disease. As you can see here, uh, we have always been uh, one of the states in the, in the union that has had some of the highest rates of hypertension in, uh, for a long time. Uh, we have a, a low socioeconomic uh, range. We have uh, many challenges when it comes to adherence rates. And as a result of that, we have had um, a lot of um, difficulty in, in with our goal attainment rates. And so at this point, we are uh, basically fighting uh, a, in a gunfight with a knife. And so we try to use every tool uh, that we can. And so anything that we can use uh, that uh, can help us, in particular our patients, to understand their pathology and to help them understand uh, what it's doing uh, to them internally uh, can be uh, of assistance. And this is where I use the aortic stiffness indices. And I use them in two settings. And of course, on the left here is a sort of a, um, I use a phlebotomy chair uh, for, my, uh, um, uh, uh, for my screenings, or at least for, for my measurements. And I have one of the older generation machines here that uh, is a uh, tonometer uh, that's uh, shaped like a pen. So uh, it, having a little bit of extra stability is always important. Now, the new generation machine is beautiful in the sense that it just, just goes on as a cuff and is very easy to use, and I, I would think that this is going to be redundant uh, with the newer generation. And of course, I use it a lot for screenings, and this is I was just recently, this month, we were at uh, a YMCA, and I use this as part of a hypertension screening, and this is one of our postdocs, Natasha, who has an interest in looking at aortic stiffness indices and environmental factors. We also have uh, a lot of pollutants, uh, particularly with a large rubber factory uh, industry in the area, and we found some signal to suggest that um, um, pollutants have also had some signal towards um, a higher aortic uh, stiffness. But long and the short of it is that, that um, in both of these settings, we've been able to find uh, the use of um, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, the modality to be very helpful. And I think that as we go forward, we'll go ahead and uh, perhaps try to uh, illustrate that for you. Of course, I wanted to go over some of the salient background uh, that may, um, of course, uh, be helpful. Uh, as you know, um, the central pressure increases. Uh, um, as we talked about, we do see an increase of uh, stroke and renal failure. Um, as the LV load increases, we do see an increase in LV mass, and uh, all these issues of LV hypertrophy and heart failure um, has been uh, already been recognized and already been shown in, in, in previous slides. This issue of heart failure is, of course, a very big one for Louisville, particularly because our rates of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, particularly in the um, African-American population, is extremely high. We have the second highest LVAD um, population in the country, uh, the left ventricular assist device um, population. Um, uh, and as a result, of uh, most of that is secondary to the hypertensor uh, that we see. Now, the portion of this, and no pun intended, or perhaps pun intended, is that this whole issue of coronary perfusion and aortic stiffness go hand in hand. And of course, as we get older, the complexity of what we see uh, of, and the dynamics of, of the waveforms gets more and more blunt. As we, get, as, that, as we get more stiff over age, what we also sacrifice as a result of that is coronary blood flow. That has been shown with multiple modalities, particularly as a cardiac imager in my coronary PET and, and, or, and uh, CT um, uh, imaging. However, um, what this allows me to do with the Sigma core is a quick and dirty, if you will, of looking at this par parameter. Um, and, and hopefully by the end of this, uh, you'll gain a better understanding of what I'm trying to sort of get at in just a moment. So. 
When I get an output for a patient, I just wanted to go ahead and show you what we get. So on the top line, of course, we're just getting the aortic pressures. And of course, what, uh, the new iteration, of course, now has the peripheral and the central pressures come up together. But, the, but uh, in my old machine, I have to take the peripheral pressures, put it in manually, and then, I have to, then the aortic pressure comes up uh, sort of subsequently. I get an aortic pressure, an aortic um, sorry, sorry, I get a, a sorry, aortic pressure, an augmentation pressure, an augmentation index, and a heart rate. Now, what does this all mean? So, going back here, the augmentation pressure is nothing more than what we talked about. Is this issue, as, as Dr. Wilkinson pointed out, is basically the reflection back of what's coming out of the left ventricle, going to the arterial or bed, coming back towards the heart. And as a measure, of course, of the stiffness and augmenting the pressure, in the central pressure within the central bed. The augmentation index is nothing more than a percentage of that of the general pulse pressure. Now, when you look down here, if you say, look at the augmentation index, okay, fine. Why is the augmentation index at, at standardized at, 75%, at, at a heart rate of 75? Well, you can imagine if your systolic and diastolic times change, you have to standardize that to some time. So as a result of that, if you standardize it to 75 beats, then you've taken that change that you would have as a, that would be chronotropic and you've just standardized it, out, standardized it to one time. Does that make sense? I hope that, that so as a result of it, that's why you have, not only is the index standardized by the pulse pressure, but it's also standardized by the chronotropy, which is the heart rate. Now, again, to sort of get you a, to a be, better sense of this, I love this sort of, um, car, well, it's not sort of a cartoon, but a little sort of video to sort of give you a sense of what's going on. In a normal, uh, or sort of a younger aorta, if you will, as, the, as we see a forward propagation from systole, what we see is that the heart, the blood flow will get to that first sort of point of resistance, which is usually the first or the second sort of arterial or um, branch point, and we see that reflection back. Now, three dynamic changes should be seen to your eye. One, of course, is that there's a change in the luminal diameter as that's going forward, right? As you can see, follow that, that's getting bigger, and that gets um, smaller and then gets bigger again. Notice that this is fairly slow, too. So this is also a function of, of velocity as well. There's a velocity component here. And of course, if you look down here, which is a reflection here, there's also a pressure component here. So there's three components here. A luminal change, a velocity change, and a pressure change. That's what happens. And this is what's, what, the, what the beauty of the vascular system is. Imagine if we didn't have the system in place and how hard that left ventricle would have to work. The fact that we have vasculature that allows the blood to go down into the periphery to allow perfusion to the very, very tips of our fingers and toes is, is testament to the fact that uh, we have a vasculature system that really works as an organ, and hence the, um, the beauty of the system and the elegance of it all. Now, as we get older and we get stiffer aortas, and we go ahead and make um, uh, perhaps um, uh, unintelligent uh, lifestyle uh, changes, as you can see here, a couple of things. The luminal changes is no longer as, um, as obvious. The velocity that's coming back is much faster. And of course, the pressure that you're seeing is much higher. So this is what we're calling as that augmentation pressure. That's what this is, is the augmentation pressure. And as you can see here, the stiffer that aorta is, the higher that augmentation pressure is. That simple. So, I mean, it, when I try to explain this to my fellows, of course they fall asleep because they all want to do interventional. So it's a different story. But the long, this, so, why does this stuff matter? And why should I be using this as an endpoint? Or why should I even care about this in my clinic? And I would say that this study really does give me some fodder for, for future thought. It's the chicken or the egg, right? It's the thought of, well, what comes first, the blood pressure? problem or the high blood pressure or does the aortic stiffness comes first? 
And the Framingham Offspring Study really did perhaps try to answer that question. So in this study, in the 1,800 participants, what, fa- what we found was that um, there was a higher arterial stiffness that, f- first, w- that was first seen seven years before the progression of blood pressure. So in other words, before the phenotypic change of high blood pressure was noted, the aorta was already stiff. So perhaps aortic stiffness leads to the high blood pressure, not the other way around. So putting this all together, if I'm going to target the aortic stiffness, am I going to go ahead and thwart the progression of of high blood pressure? It's a thought. And particularly now, as the guidelines being clear as mud, I may need an extra tool to be able to use that as my surrogate endpoint. So that's sort of what, where I'm coming at this as a clinician. Is it right? Is it wrong? I'm not sure. You've, you've seen some of the data already. So the point is that, I'm, is some of this conjecture? Sure. Is, but at the end of the day, there's certainly enough surrogate endpoint um, evaluation and correlation that, that at least to m- in my mind, gives me enough um, a rationale to go ahead and, and, and use this approach. So for me in the clinic, there's six, or at least in this point, five different things that really help me with this. And I'm going to go over a few cases with you that I think were kind of um, changing to me that really sort of highlighted to me, the, and, and particularly to my staff, the importance of, of, of using aortic stiffness indices in the clinic. One is that it's been an extremely important driver of lifestyle choices. Number one, that it has helped me with my regimen changes. It's helped me to, make a ch- uh, to, to really make a decision whether or not I'm actually going to treat a patient for hypertension or, or whether I'm not going to treat them. A diagnosis of aortic conditions or systemic processes. And of course, the issue of treatment adherence. In my population, as I've spoken to you, treatment adherence has been a major issue. Is the uh, possibility that the signal that I'm getting from, this, um, uh, from these uh, tests uh, giving me an indication of whether my patient is actually doing a good job of whether medications are getting into the alimentary tract and being metabolized by the patient, or are they sitting on some, uh, on some shelf uh, or gathering dust. So let's go to the first one. This is a 52-year-old female with a history of smoking, poor, so, uh, poor so, uh, sodium-rich diet, who's currently on a regimen of, um, of uh, hydrochlorothiazide and deltiazem at 360. Now, on the left panel here, you're seeing the radial uh, pressure of 114 over 71 uh, uh, with a mean pressure of 88 and a pulse pressure of 43. On the right-hand side of the yellow is an aortic um, pressure, or the central pressure, with a blood pressure of 110 over 71 um, and a, um, a mean pressure of 88 and a pulse pressure of 39. While these pressures look very good, we find two things here. We find that the augmentation pressure is quite high for her age and sex uh, match. And we find that the augmentation index for her age is very high as well, 52, while the upper limit of normal is 39. There's two points here that, are, um, that I look at for my own practice, and one that I'm still trying to grapple with, and I think there's some, as I'm trying to gather more data, I hope that I can get uh, an answer for you, or at least to get, uh, or at least get it, make more sense of it. This Figma core machine also has the ability to give me what's called an injection duration, which is very simply the percentage of time that the left ventricle is actually pumping blood out. Very simply, the less time that the left ventricle is working, the better it is for the left ventricle, right? I mean, you want to have that left ventricle pump as efficiently as possible, particularly for my heart failure patients. If I have a patient with systolic heart failure, I'm, it's in my best interest that that patient's ejection duration be, be less than, if it were, than more. And this subendocardial viability ratio is nothing more than the ratio of the, of the area under the curves going back to that entire curve that we looked at, the area of the curve of diastole divided by systole multiplied by 100. So it's nothing more than a ratio of how much time is spent in diastole versus the time spent in systole. Now, why is that important for me? It's important because much of my coronary blood flow happens in diastole. So if I have more time in diastole, I'm allowing that patient to have more coronary blood flow. 
and if, in my patients with coronary artery disease, that's my goal. Now, is this going to be an endpoint in the future that I could potentially use, and is this how I'm going to tailor make my, my regimens? That time will tell, and I'm just using this as a, I'm just letting you know that this is, this is available uh, as a part of the, the package, but it's not something that really has a great deal of data to it just yet, but we're, again, like I said, we're still getting to the point of trying to get some signal for it. So lo and behold, going back to this woman who had fairly good pressures on her diltiazem and hydrochlorothiazide, turns out that if we go ahead and look at this, now we also get what we call a vascular age from this. Of all the things that my patients get from this whole thing, this vascular age thing is the most ground-breaking or the earth-shattering thing that they ever get. She finds out she has a vascular age of greater than 90. She sits there, she gets there, she cries, and, and her whole life just uh, crumbles. She goes on a major diet and exercise regimen. Lo and behold, you know, of course, this changes. My point is this, is that you know, results... Uh, of the test prompted the, the, the patient to make better lifestyle choices, and including smoking cessation and diet, and he, she's stuck to it. She's done a great job. Emotional reaction to the vascular age was, as a concept is what elicited that change. And the reason why I think that is, and I can tell you this because I've had about a hundred and something cases where this has happened, is that the concept of vascular age to me, and for my patients, particularly in my subset of patients, is a lot less esoteric than something like a blood pressure or an aortic stiffness. When I tell them that you're 65 from the inside, even though chronologically you're 45, that kills them. My women want to kill me. But, what they, but, but at the same time, I'll tell you that it really does elicit some beautiful changes. I think, and so if for nothing else, if that's what this elicits, so be it. I mean, and, and we'll, I mean so that's been a very important point for me at least. Here's another interesting, so I told you that I do a lot of screenings, and I, and I put in this aortic stiffness thing as part of my screening, because at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's, there's always a, an element of sexiness when you go into one of these sort of churches or, or, or YMCAs and you say, what's your vascular age? And so there's, I had this opportunity where I had two identical 51-year-old African-American twins who came in to check their vascular ages, and they both had, of course, the same phenotype, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and obesity. Twin one had a regimen that included lisinopril, amlodipine, and carvedilol. On the left, blood pressure of 112 over 70, uh, uh, aortic pressure of 101 over 70. Everything looks pretty good here. Lo and behold, her uh, augmentation pressure looks great. Augmentation index looks great. Pat on the back, vascular age is somewhere between 35 and 37. We say fantastic, good for you. Twin two. Regimen, atenolol, losartan, hydrochlorothiazide. Vascular age, 78. Augmentation pressure, 44, 48. Sorry, uh, augmentation 18. Augmentation index higher. And of course, look at, that, uh, look at that aortic pressure, 48. Again, highlighting the fact that the regimen changes on, and the regimen drives what happens. So again, huge changes or huge differences within the central indices versus the peripheral, even though these patients had the, by definition, if they're identical twins, probably have the same mechanism of hypertension. Um, but of course, the regimen makes all the difference. In this case, we had a 38-year-old female with recently diagnosed hypertension who came in for a secondary workup. Given her age, she only had one value of 140 over 92. Like, I don't know why she was initially um, um, sort of relayed to us, but the very astute primary care physician went ahead and ordered all these indices, of course, to go ahead and look for a uh, secondary workup, which were all negative, and of course, no findings correlated with the coarctation. The um, peripheral blood pressure was 136, 91, 132 and 92 at the aortic, and um, mean pressures and, and pulse pressures, of course, as you can see here, on the radial and the aortic, respectively. We went ahead and took a look at the, um, the sigma core. This 38-year-old female, again, had a, um, a pulse pressure uh, in the aorta of 40, an augmentation pressure of 18, and an augmentation index of 39. Extremely high vascular age. 
So this prompted us to go ahead and do a 24-hour blood pressure monitor, which showed that a mean, a mean waking blood pressure of 157 to 104, with a mean sleeping pressure of 148 over 99. So here we found out that we had out of proportion and organ damage that was noted, even though the blood pressures were low. And she fit the entire bill for someone who had mast hypertension. And it took a 24-hour blood pressure monitor to go ahead and confirm that. And so that this patient was placed on a much more aggressive antihypertensive regimen. We would have probably sent her home on a hydrochlorothiazide and called it a day. She would have come back to us in 10 years with a stroke. I'm glad to say that we probably sort of halted that process. So here's a 72-year-old female with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and a remote history of TIA. Again, on the left, I'm going to go and highlight here um, on the left, the, the uh, systolic pressure of 144, a diastolic of 70, mean pressure of 96, and a pulse pressure of 74. On the right, 138 of, on the aortic, 70, mean pressure of 96, and the pulse of 68. Again, aortic pressure of uh, very high at 60, uh, aortic pulse pressure of very high at 68, an augmentation pressure of 27, and aortic pressure very high. So. If I were to just go by this pressure, and if I were to go by JNC8 guidelines, I'd tell her to, you know, have a cookie and go home. And um, I would have to say that if she was my sister or mom, I would probably not. And I think this is where I'm using the aortic stiffness indices as my guide. And this is where I'm using the European guidelines and, of course, the ACC AHA guidelines to help me with this. The, e e the where the ESH and the ECC e uh, and the uh, American Society, the European Society of Euro Cardiology guidelines differed from ours is this idea that pulse wave velocity, which of course is a different, uh, again another index, index of aortic stiffness, can be used um, as a marker of end organ damage, and that there's limited data in looking at the prognostic value of changes. In other words, using the delta change here as a means of treatment. So if I have this at my disposal, and if I, if I know that this could potentially be there, I certainly can't, in, some, in, in a lot of um, my screenings, I certainly can't go ahead and do an ECG on everyone. I can't, get a, I can't go ahead and get a creatinine. I can't get a protein excretion. I can't get a carotid IMT. But I can sure as heck get a, uh, a, a two-minute um, aortic stiffness index. So I think this is one way of really doing it. And for me, I have used this in those... For me, for my patients between the ages of 60 and 80 with a blood pressure between 140 and 150, to treat more aggressively or not, this has been one of the ways of doing it. This has been one of my more interesting cases, and this is a 55-year-old male physician um, who works as part of our faculty, who comes in with a long-standing history of hypertension since his 20s and comes in for evaluation. The first thing, as we noted, and I, sh and I showed you that initially, for a guy who has these pressures that are pretty high, this is a pretty dynamic um, uh, waveform. There's a lot of lines here, a lot of squigglies. Initially, I thought, boy, this guy's really healthy. These, pa these numbers make no sense. He just must be really nervous. Lo and behold, we go ahead and do an aortic stiffness. And of course, his aortic pressure is really high, but his pulse pressure is low. His, uh, his augmentation pressure is really low. And his, and his augmentation index is, again, sort of in that reference range. His, again, his vascular age is 40, even though he's 55. So I go ahead and do an echo on him, just because I can. And I see all this. And I, what I see here, and if, uh, for those of you, well, you know, I see this floppy mitral valve. And he's got pretty severe mitral valve prolapse. So it turns out he has Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So this connective tissue disorder, and it turns out that we went ahead and screened his family members, and some of them had it too. And what's sort of important about this is that there are some, of course, this is a rare case. I'm not going to say this is going to happen every day in my clinic. But the long and the short of it, it's kind of nice to be able to use the tool to go ahead and pick up some, 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 some sort of uh, systemic problems.
The last case really highlights this issue of treatment adherence. In my 46-year-old female with a history of hypertension, she was treated with um, amlodipine and losartan for one year, and she's had a history of non-adherence, and she's a wonderful lady. She wants to keep me happy, she, we have a good relationship, but she's just terrible about taking her medications. And so she, for the, her first visit, this is her blood pressure, 121 over 83, but 117 over 83 here in the aortic, and things are looking okay. And of course, she has some signal here that tells me that things aren't, you know, that they're, she's sort of borderline. She's got an augmentation pressure of 15, and she's got an augmentation index that's sort of in that higher side at 38. But three months later, I went ahead and put her on these, all these meds. And of course, lo and behold, now she's, you know, her, again, one of the things that happens is that her blood pressure comes back. She's sort of in that, sort of, still in that normal, I mean, nothing that's really out of too high. Again, look at the waveforms, about the same uh, in the radial side, but 131 over 88, 127 over 89. But really, no change or perhaps even worse. And what I find is that a check with the outpatient pharmacy notes that there's no refills in the last two months. So clearly, if she had been taking her medications for those two months, I would have seen some improvement here in these, in, in these indices. But there was no improvement. What she had done is that she sang like a canary and said that because she didn't want to disappoint me, she took her blood pressure medications the morning of. Of course, she had a little bit of a decrease in her blood pressure, but amlodipine, as you know, with this long half-life, isn't really going to do a whole lot, and that's why they were sort of on that higher range. So that was the issue. So in summary, the central blood pressure waveform provides information on arterial stiffness and wave reflection that is not available from standard brachial blood pressure cuff measurements. And in terms of the, um, the wave reflection parameters, such as central pulse pressure and augmentation index, um, they can provide information regarding the potential impact on a patient's hypertension and cardiovascular risk, the assessment of the source of hypertension, the choice of the antihypertensive regimen, including the medication ch changes, and the assessment of the efficacy of the antihypertension treatment and the direction of the further treatment. So I thank you very much for your attention. And